Um, yeah, so you have mentioned already, so this will not be about universal AI, but about a more practical approach. I mean, practical from my perspective. Um, <coughs> uh, but nevertheless, I will mention universal AI and, and, and show a little bit the relation because it was you know, developed from that. But before I start, um, first, um, since I'm also the PC chair, or PC co-chair, Pascal Hitzler couldn't come. I think he gets a new baby. Um, I would like to thank um, the PC members um, for their great work of reviewing all the papers, um, and even more the authors for submitting the great papers, and finally the audience um, to whom we can present our papers. Okay, it's also great that um, Itamar Alma gave already a talk on tutorial um, on reinforcement learning, so you know all the basics about it, and I don't have to repeat it, which is very good. And I think the next speaker doesn't mind if I take all his time, um, so I will talk. I will talk for 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, actually, that is true um, because I will not talk about um, the dynamic version network stuff because that's just—I mean—that's the toy model. That's the basic idea here, the feature mark of decision process. But then to go from the toy model. Um, to, I mean, realistic models. You need dynamic Bayesian networks. I have one slide on it, but it just makes things more complex, but more practical. So, let me start. First, um, so I added this slide yesterday um, after I've seen this discussion here. I, I think it makes pretty much sense um, if you first um, put yourself in a corner. Um, so, we had these discussions and fights about you know, what AGI is, and uh, some people work on systems which think, others on systems which act, and others want to mimic humans and other rationality. And I mean, these are just some examples. For instance, the Turing test is about you know, how to act humanly, and cognitive science is about how to think humanly, and so on. And um, I'm here in this right bottom corner. I want to build systems which act rationally. I don't care about human thinking, human action, and so on. And you know, if you work on systems which think humanly, then of course logic and reasoning plays a big role. But for systems which act rationally, it is possibly only an emergent phenomenon. I mean, you know, in order to act intelligently, it sometimes helps to reason, but sometimes not. Okay. Um, so, and as long as we are below the threshold of, say, self-improving systems, I think this difference matters. Maybe once we have reached this threshold, you know, it doesn't really matter where you come from because then the systems get so smart that, you know, an intelligent thinking or humanly thinking system or superhuman will then, you know, be able also to be perfectly rational or whatever. But as long as we're below it, the difference matters. And of course, there are integrated approaches like Ben Goertzel's, I mean, who try to, you know, do everything. Um, that's probably also a good idea. Um, is that a rough summary? Okay. Um, so what is universal AI about? Universal AI is an analytically analyzable generic reinforcement learning system. So um, it's analytically analyzable, so it's formal and simple enough, um, but nevertheless it's generic and the important part is learning. So um, the real world is really nasty. It's partial unobservable, observable, um, uncertain, unknown, non-ergodic, reactive, vast, but luckily it's structured. So, um, it doesn't make sense to have a theory that just deals with IID data or so. But, I mean, this universe AI deals with really complex environments. And um, at least if you are in this corner here, um, dealing with uncertainty and learning is absolutely crucial. It's not something, oh, I have, you know, my deterministic system and I build my knowledge and then, you know, the learning I put somewhere in and the uncertainty I, I deal with in some heuristic way. That will not work. I mean, you have to take that seriously, at least in this right bottom corner. And um, you probably agree to that you should not trust a theory if it's not supported by an experiment. But I think even more true is that you should not trust an experiment if it's not supported by a theory. Um, we can discuss that afterwards, but um, I've seen too many experimental papers, you know, and there's even a paper at NIPS, I mean, how to carefully select your data that your algorithm looks best, best um, how to do that in a scientific way. And um, also, normally, you stop debugging your program when it does what you want to, not when it's you know, really correct. 
And so you have to be, and they are more wrong experimental papers than theoretical, wrong theoretical papers, fractions. So this other direction is at least as true as the other direction. And okay, so let's make a compromise. Progress is achieved by an interplay between theory and experiment, and this hopefully justifies my existence. So, um, so universal AI is, um, you know, a theory of universal AI. Um, I will only um, have one slide about that. And this model is about hopefully bridging the gap between this incomputable theory and practical down-to-earth, more limited approaches. And as I mentioned, learning and planning play a crucial role. And also information and complexity. This is, I find, pretty amazing computer science is about information processing, AI systems are about information, and count the number of papers which talk about information theory. Yeah? So I don't understand that, why information is not you know, more important in AI, and it is crucial in the universal AI model and also in the fine P model. Um, and this is based on you know, search and optimization algorithms and everything in AI. Um, logic may play a role or not. Um, it's useful for some things. Um, is a general AI framework, and I will not discuss the interface. I mean, whether you have vision or language or a, a robot. I mean, this is um, this would be too practical. Okay. So here, um, find DP one slide overview. So what is this model about? So the goal is, as our goal here is to build general purpose intelligent systems. So what is the state of the art? The IC model is an incomputable theoretical solution. So let's go to the other extreme. What can we do? And this is pretty sad. Um, what can be solved are finite state MDPs. And even this is quite non-trivial to learn. I come to that. Um, it's a Markov decision process. Um, this is what um, Itamar um, talked about. Okay. So as soon as you go to partial observability, so I mean chess is completely observable, but the real world not, um, it's notoriously difficult. I think. There are now papers who deal with four states or so. Um, that's the state of the art. And PSR, um, this predictive state representations, is maybe an alternative. So PMDP is a big topic, but I really have little hope that you know it leads to something really practical. It, it's it, it's really hard. Okay. So the idea here is: so on the one hand, we want to deal with complex environments. On the other hand, we can only solve finite state MDPs. What people do in practice is they look at their problem and try to phrase it as a finite state MVP. Um, and this is done by hand. So why not automatize that? And then learn this reduction. Okay? And that's what this model is about. So what I have accomplished so far is, um, first you need a criterion for evaluating the reduction, and what is a good and what is a bad reduction. Then I will also tell you about how to integrate all these parts together to get a real system. So, every, so all parts are there. So you can implement it already, and I actually implemented it. So I mean, not all parts, you know, as I present here, are good enough for any practical applications. But there's no missing loop here or so. And I generalized that to a more or less the BBNs, which I will come to. So I, uh, I think that's a promising path towards the grand goal and an alternative to, you know. A to D. So uh, we all know so the agent framework, you have an agent which acts and then the environment reacts um, with some observation to the agent and occasionally some reward signal telling the agent whether he's done something good or not. I mean it can be sparse like you know, at the end of a chess game whether it has won or lost or more rich. Um, more or less all AI problems can be formulated in this framework. But okay that's a framework is there one single universal agent, you know, which is good, very good in all environments. So we have to discuss environments, but I will more or less skip that. So a lot of environments, and here's some classification, and I mean the framework at least is good enough to deal with all these environments, and universal AI too. So what is universal AI? I will not explain that in detail, but the key idea is you look for the optimal action, or say plan or policy, based on the simplest world model which is consistent with the history. So you take your history, 
build the simplest model which is consistent, assume that this is the right model, and then plan accordingly. That's not exactly true, but roughly. Okay? So the nice thing is you can write the complete model down in one line. Okay, that may not, not look too simple, but if you think that codes the notion of intelligent behavior, optimal intelligent behavior, I think that's pretty amazing. And so what you have here, you are at, so you have cycles, one, two, three, four, five, now we are cycle K. The future observations, the rewards are RK plus up to RM, at M the agent dies. So that's your future reward sum. But of course we don't know that that is uncertain. So what we have to do is we look for models, models mean your programs, which given a certain policy, so action sequence, produce a certain observation and reward sequence. So that's some possible model. The model shall be consistent with the history, so this O1 up to O K minus one must coincide with the history. So we only consider models which are consistent. And then they produce some future. And rather than taking the simplest one, which would be Occam's razor, you take Epicurus into account, which tells you take all theories, and if you combine them, you have a higher rate to more simple theories. So what you do is you weight each theory by two to the minus its length. Okay. So this gives you a mixture, and this is a probability distribution over the futures, and you take the expectation, which is what is you do with your sums. Okay, so far so good. Now you want to take a good action. Good action means getting a lot of reward, so you want to maximize this with respect to your actions, and you have to do that in chronological order. So A, K, and A, K plus one, intercepted by the sums. So that gives this expected max tree, which is very similar to the minimax, you know, from zero sum games, just written in this form. And so the R gives you the, end, the optimal action at time K, then you make a new observation and reward, then you have time K plus one, and things repeat. This is an elegant, I mean, arguably, but I have not seen anything shorter, which you know has no obvious faults. Um, it's complete, it's essentially unique, there are no free parameters to play with, so it's not a framework, yeah? everything is there. I haven't defined you, you is a universal Turing machine, so I assume that you know what it is. Okay. And um, it's limit computable, so it's not too far up in the arithmetic hierarchy. So it's still limit computable. Um, limit computable, there's no algorithm which after finite time pause and gives you the answer, but there's an algorithm which can approximate the answer, answer, and in this case, even after finite time, you have the correct answer, but you never know whether this is the correct answer or whether it will change its mind. Um, so it's in Sigma 2, if, uh, sorry, it's in, um, yes, in, it's in Delta 2. Okay. So my claim is that this is the most intelligent, environmental, independent, universally optimal agent possible. Okay, that's a lot of words, and um, you can formalize that, quantify that, and prove that, and um, you need a whole book for that. Does that depend, though, on the assumption that what what that means, the most intelligent agent yeah. is that you will maximize this reward function over your lifetime. Yeah. But why is that necessarily the most intelligent agent? Because that is what you want. That is your goal. I mean, you have an agent. Well, that's a postulate. It's a definition. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's an axiom for your... Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, think about, you know, a human, you raise him and you want to, you know, I mean, that's also your personal, to begin, you want to maximize your reward. Reward doesn't necessarily mean money, but, you know. Well, reward changes with time. There's not necessarily one universal schedule of reward. Yeah, yeah, wait, this reward, yeah, is not, you know, some simple to define function, but this is either connected to your internal, you know, organs, yeah, and to some survival or, you know, spreading. Well, um, behavior. Well, just a, a matter of uh, order, I guess we're, we're trying to hold questions till after everyone's yeah. their bit. No okay. And in any case, that's not the topic of my talk. Um, so there's one problem, it's computationally intractable, but it is nevertheless, I think, a useful step forward because it well defines, well, it's one um, definition of well-defining AGI, and it's the only one I know of. Um, um, it can serve as a gold standard, which we can aim to. Um, it inspired already practical algorithms, and finally, he's not the only one. I have 
also other papers um, and others um, were inspired by that. And just compared to Minimax, von Neumann in 1944 invented Minimax to the end, which is totally unfeasible for all interesting um, zero-sum games, but nevertheless it's a starting point for most um, real games, then you put heuristics in and prune things and so on. Okay, so let's now go to the other extreme. So that was, you know, high up there. And now let's go down to Earth, mark of decision processes. Um, you assume that your observation is your state, there's nothing hidden. And um, the next state is a probabilistic um, function of your previous state and your action. And you have some rewards which are functions of the states. So further, let's assume that the state space is finite. I mean, you can always discretize and make it finite, but um, the key is that let's assume also it's small, which is you know, not true. Um, in real world. So think about your system, say your knowledge based system, whatever you have, and just code all this yeah, in one girdle number, and the girdle number is your, your state. This is of course ridiculous, um, but um, I will come to that and the, the, the DBN model um, fixes that. But okay, let's assume it's small, and the goal is again to maximize long term expected reward. Since you don't know the probability distribution, you have to learn it, and you can do that. Um, the difficult thing is um, the exploration, and to do it optimally um, is computationally intractable, um, but there are recent polynomial time algorithms who deal with this problem, and actually the most recent version is from Andras Lorenz um, and his student, and he's sitting here, so it's an ISML 2008 paper, uh, which is, I recommend you to read that, that's really an amazing paper to solve um, this exploration exploitation problem for finite state MDPs, and he told me it's also now solved for um, DBNs. So, everything is fine except that the real world is not a finite state MVP. Okay? So, what people do is, you have, say, this is your history. You take your history and summarize it into a state, and then hope that this gives you an MVP. And you do that by hand. So, for instance, the example is, if you have a full information game, then um, just the last observation is your state like in chess, what you observe is your state, and the state space, okay, is still too large, but at least it's a finite state. So in physics, if you have the position and the velocity of all particles, it's an MDP. Instead of the velocity, you can take two time slices, like here. So if you take two time slices, then you reduce it to an MDP. Pretty big and continuous, but okay. Um, for IID process, what you do is you take the statistical summary, I mean, how often which observation occurs, and this is a sufficient statistics, and then you know you can deal with that. So there are just a few examples, or you just take the history itself as a state. It's a pretty big infinite MDP, but it's an MDP now. Um, unfortunately, it's not learnable, so it's not so useful. But okay, that's just examples. So rather than doing it by hand, let's try to automatize that. So before you can do that. You need a criterion, which reductions are good and which are bad. So a cost function, and then the minimum is regarded as best. Yeah? OK, you have to define this cost function, define what is best, and so on. Okay. So um, first question is, so what is the best MDP, or best reduction? So what is the right criterion? Then is the best reduction good enough? I mean, I haven't shown you that you can reduce all problems to finance that MDPs. And indeed, you can. And finally. Um, how to find this map efficiently. So let's answer these questions step by step. Um, okay, those of you who are familiar with the minimal description length principle, you know, see some um, close relation. Um, those of who are not familiar with this, regard it as an instantiation of Occam's razor. You know, doing something simple is finding short descriptions and so on. So I, I cannot really derive this here. So um, what you do is the following. You have this state sequence generated from the observation sequence from phi, which gives you a reward sequence, and you code this reward sequence. If it's an MDP, there's an optimal way to code that, and let CL be the length of this code. If, in order to have a complete code, I need the states, because this is a code of the rewards given the states. So I also have the, to code the state sequence, and there's also an optimal way to do that. I mean, in linear time, so that's not a problem. So let's consider a phi 
which gives you a very small state space. Say, assume one state or so. Then, coding the states is very simple, and this will be small, but it's totally useless for coding for, or for having any information about the reward sequence. So, the reward sequence to code this, this will be a very long code. On the other hand, take a very large state space, I mean, think about taking all the history, then the rewards are already in there. Then coding the rewards is trivial or easy, but coding the state sequence um, is very hard. I mean, it's not hard, it gives you a long code. So if you take the sum of both code lengths, what you can see is that this is minimized for compromise. For state space is neither too large nor too small. So remember that the states are a function of the history. So that's the phi MVP model. You take the code length of both, sum it, and look for a phi which minimizes this code length. And this is, um, in the paper I claim, I mean I'm very cautious in the paper, so that is the optimal phi in a certain sense, and in the meanwhile I have a proof of that. Um, I'll say a proof sketch. <laughs> okay, so how can we, so, so now we have the cost criterion. So before that, it was not clear yeah. what is a good phi, what is a bad phi. Intuitively, yes, but not formally. Next thing is we have to find the minimum. And I mean, this is now a formal function which can be easily evaluated, but finding the minimum can be hard. There are a lot of techniques. I will not go into that. I mean, random search, blind search, informed, adaptive, local, global, population, based, exhaustive, heuristic search. <laughs> um, all these kinds of methods. Just take something. Um, I mean, not just anything. I mean, this is a hard problem, but um, it's really quite separated at this stage. Um, for most of these, nearly all of these search problems, you need a, a notion of neighborhood. So one is one phi similar to another, and there's a very natural neighborhood. So first, if you look at this mapping, it induces a partition on your history. So all histories which lead to the same state can be regarded as one partition. And so the phi is just in a, a different form of partitioning the state space, uh, the history space. And for instance, you can use decision trees or lists or grids or whatever. And then a natural neighborhood is to merge two partitions or to split two partitions. <coughs> so Andrew McCullum's work in the 1960s, 1969's PhD thesis was about suffix trees, which is sort of, if you want, an instantiation of this general framework. So, and probably you need some stochastic search method, and the standard thing is that you choose a neighbor now, phi prime, I define what a neighbor is, split, splitting or merging a state, and then you replace the original phi if the cost gets smaller, or if the cost gets larger, then only by some small probability. I mean, this is very nice, of course, but that's one way to search with, with some Monte Carlo. So let's assume now we have found a good approximation phi hat of our best reduction phi. We take this phi hat, which induces a state action sequence, which is approximately MVP by construction. So let's pretend it's an MVP. So what we now want is to determine the best next action. If we would know the transition probabilities, that would be easy, um, just from the Bellman equations. And I mean, they are practically quite fast converging algorithms, which in theory can fail and they are theoretically polynomial time algorithms which nobody uses in practice, so but you have everything. I mean, you have guaranteed algorithms and you have practical algorithms. But we don't know the transition probability. So we have to learn it. Learning is also trivial in a completely observable MVP. We just take a frequency estimate. But then we run into the infamous exploration exploitation problem. If you would now take just plug it into the Bellman equation and solve it, the system would not explore enough. And uh, this is the polynomial optimal solutions I mentioned. So the first one was Rmax, and then came E3, and now a really nice one called um, optimistic initial model. Um, this, in a certain sense, solved this problem, I would say. I mean, the polynomial is too high, but in practice it works, and I think it can be improved. But I wouldn't worry about that. There are much more, I mean, there are bigger problems to worry about. So, um, and the main idea here is an algorithm. You invent a heaven state where you pretend that you get a high reward, 
and initially the agent believes that there is some chance to go from any state with a reasonably high probability to heaven. <laughs> so once the agent learns for a state that's not true, it adapts his um, belief. But the, if there's a state which is not well explored, the agent believes, oh, I could go there to heaven. So it tries to reach the state and explore it and then find out, you know, okay, heaven is not there. Um, that is pretty mean. But <laughs> but what you can show is that um, in this scheme you make at most a polynomial number of suboptimal actions, and the algorithm runs in polynomial time. Okay, I mean polynomial may not good enough for practical purposes, but roughly speaking, you can say exponentially. You now forget about it, and the big step is from exponential to polynomial. And once you have polynomial, it's typically an engineering task to, to squeeze it down to something really practical. Yeah. It's just you know a matter of effort. Okay. Um, it's simplifying, but yeah. Okay, so here's the complete model. You have your environment. You get the reverse observations, um, which leads to histories. You have a cost criterion um, for reductions to MDPs, which gives you an approximate. I mean, this gives you tells you what is the best reduction which you approximate with, which, with phi hat. Then you have a finite state MDP. You can easily estimate a transition and reward function, which doesn't really help you, but if you add the exploration bonus and just solve the Bellman equation, then you get the value and the Q value and the best policy and the best policy which trades off also exploration and exploitation. And then you're in the next cycle. So, so far, so good. So next question is, how many real-world problems can be reduced to finite state MDPs? Um, not too many, um, if you take unstructured MDPs. But dynamic Bayesian networks, or it's also called uh, factored MDPs, what you do there is, rather than having a state which has a number, you take a vector over some discrete space, say binary. So each node of your Bayesian network represents some feature. And then you have this vector of features, which can represent an exponential number of states, exponentially in the length of this vector. And the nice thing is that um, all these algorithms before, there exist algorithms for DBNs, um, which run in polynomial time in the number of nodes. And remember, the number of states is exponential in the number of nodes. Yeah. So it running time is logarithmic in the number of states. And you, you come to a reasonable system. And DBN is say roughly similar to a neural network. I mean, you have these nodes and you have interactions um, and you know, it's change over time. So if you don't know what a DBN is, think about a, a neural network, however the nodes are the neurons. Okay. Um, I said that. There are a lot of additional complications. Now you have to assign this global reward signal to the different neurons. So how responsible are the different neurons for the rewards. The most simple thing is you do it by linear regression. Um, that may not be good enough for practice, but that's a good first step. And actually, I believe that it's good enough. So they are, uh, because <coughs> DBNs, if you learn the structure, are extremely robust and anything, or not anything, so many things you do not optimal in one way can be compensated by um, finding a different DBN with different um, links. So now your cost criterion is a function of um, the mapping phi and the structure. And the cost is just the sum of the local nodes. You can learn the optimal structure in pseudo-polynomial time. So in general, it's a hard problem. But if you look at this cost criterion, you can cut off a priori most of the structures, which is quite nice. Pseudo-polynomial leads means you know, sub-exponential, but higher than polynomial. So that's not really good enough. Um, then again, you approximate the best phi by phi hat. And the neighborhood relation now is particularly nice. Um, I mean, one possible neighborhood. The natural one is just adding a feature or removing a feature, or adding a neuron and removing a neuron, including its connections. And the cost criterion tells you when this is reasonable to add a neuron representing some information or remove it because you know, it's not so useful anymore. Okay. Um, 
Yes. Okay, and also the um, the exploration exploitation you can solve. And um, okay, here are some key papers. I mean, to deal with um, dynamic yeah. Asian networks. <coughs> so that is my conclusion slide, which is the same as um, the overview slide. So I can skip that. Um, but now you understand what is going on. Um, so I really have good hopes that this is sort of the missing link between universal AI theory and down to earth practical but limited approaches. Um, if you fill out all the details and then you know you want to address a practical problem, then you realize, oh, phi has to be represented somehow. So there are different structures. Yeah? So maybe a knowledge um, uh, decision trees based on rules, for instance, can be useful there, or also in the Bayesian network stuff. So um, probably you can plug in a lot of narrow AI techniques you know, in the various bits and pieces. Um, so skip that. Um, I think I presented that here too. So I mean, there's this you know, duality, let's call it neutrally, between AGI and narrow AI. Um, but I think, you know, both communities can learn from, it, from each other. And here are some lessons for narrow AI students. I mean, first, you should not lose the big picture, which narrow AI researchers quickly do, I agree. There's a sub-community of reinforcement learning, and there are some people who care about the big picture. I'm one of them, but not the only one. Um, the good old-fashioned AI people, everything is uncertain and learning is key, and not something to add later on. And for the statistical machine learners, 95% are considering IID data. And IID, you know, the world is not IID. You know, that has nothing to do with AI. Um, it's useful, yeah? but okay, it's not leading to AGI. But in return now, some lessons for AGI students. Do your homework. Yeah. Read Russell and Norwick word by word. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? You can reject it later, but I mean, there's a lot of useful stuff there. And Brian Mill's last AGI has published a paper here, which was a great paper. I mean, it was his vision how AGI could be solved. Go through the references and read all these papers. There's good stuff out there which can help you. Or at least now you can you know, qualifiedly reject these ideas. OK. Um, that's the end of my talk. That's the papers. Um, that's my book. Um, if you're more practically inclined, you can win up to 50,000 euro by um, compressing text. So, um, and I've explained on the web page why text compression is, you know, there's not much difference between text compression and general AI. Um, okay, that's it. Thanks for your attention.